Lights. Camera. Rolling. Action. He's looking at you, kid. Say hello to my little friend! Hi, this is Joe, and this is the Film Joe Podcast, where film talk happens. One, two, three, Hi, I'm Joe, your host, and I'm here with my co-host, Daisy. Hello. And welcome to the podcast where we talk about films, filmmakers, strands, the good, the bad, and the not so bad, all in the spirit and for the love of film. So this week, we got the original versus the remake. We're going to cover a pretty good one, a classic, Assault on Precinct 13 from 1976, directed by John Carpenter, and it's 2005 remake. So really good films. I I uh, I was really uh, excited to cover these for this episode. Before we continue here, let's keep in mind that we're not professional film critics here. We're just giving our opinions and we're just having fun talking about movies. What do you That's say? Right. That's, That's right. That's right. All right. Now, based on the films that uh, we are covering, we are going to give us on the film drill scale a rating of w- between one and ten precincts okay okay good all right i thought you're gonna fight me on that one i i, I, I was i was thinking well maybe you know cigarettes you know ah cigarettes would have been a good one yeah yeah <laughs> yeah well, we'll stick with precincts yeah you know what, what cigarettes? cigarette yeah we'll go with, okay we'll go with cigarettes all right <laughs> what do you say we jump into this episode yeah yeah let's go all right so before we jump into the actual episode episode i also want to mention that this is our second to last episode of the season Ooh, damn. Yeah, i can't believe we you know we've done yeah, what 20 episodes in and it doesn't feel like it so uh um, oh, well you know it happens when we're having fun yeah yeah time definitely flies uh we can have fun and uh so next week will be our last episode of the season uh before we go on break now we're not disappearing 100 percent. we will be dropping um a few bonus episodes shorter episodes to keep you into the game so yeah that's what we're gonna do but we'll go more into that next week so now here's our segment if you could remake one movie what would it be so mm. Mm, yeah so i'm i've got my pick already and uh my pick is twilight zone the movie okay i, I mean i love the ori- uh, the the original yeah the original's great even though it was plagued with controversy and unfortunate tragedy oh that's right yeah yeah mm. rick morrow uh who was uh the star of one of the episodes he unfortunately passed away with two children while filming a sequence and john landis almost went to jail because of it oh so, shit. yeah yeah and uh so why would i remake it well it's kind of a remake yet not because mm-hmm. it's twilight zone and it's an anthology and we're not remaking uh, the actual episodes over again. A- and the original, if you remember, it was three episodes. It was four. Three mm-hmm. were from the actual series, the Rod Serling series. And one was a brand spanky new episode. Well, it, that one was uh, um, Steven Spielberg, wasn't it? Yeah, I think Spielberg did his own uh, thing there. So I'm going to recast and uh, the, the four episodes, okay? And okay. get a director for each. So, do you remember an episode called Eye of the Beholder? Where, Eye of the Beholder? Is that the, the uh, is that the one with the racism? No, that's the one with the lady. She's wrapped up in bandages, her face, and you don't see her face through the whole episode. Oh, oh okay, okay. You're talking about the, the actual episode. Um, yes, okay, yeah. I do remember now. Okay, yes. and, they just, and they unbandaged her. She was gorgeous, and everybody's uh-huh. like, oh, she's so horrible. And because everyone else was horrible looking, and that was the natural beauty. That that one was a good episode. Yeah. So as far as cast, I didn't get a cast together. That can, you can cast almost anybody, mm-hmm. but the director, I would choose David Lynch from Blue Velvet and uh, Twin mm. Peaks. So oh would, shit! Yeah, that that yeah, he's he's weird. <laughs> yeah. So I think he would definitely fit the bill for that one. Uh, and then uh, number two, episode number two within this uh, anthology in the film, mm-hmm. 
to serve man. Oh, yes. I love that episode. Yes. Because it has that crazy twist at the end where it's like the book. It's a cookbook. Great episode. <laughs> fucking love that one. Yes, that shit was fucking badass. So the director I've chosen would be M. Night Shyamalan. Oh, the, the king of twists. Exactly. Because he keeps trying to do twists now or new stuff. I heard that Trap, his new film, really sucked balls. So, That's um, sad. Yeah, and it's unfortunate, but you know what? He's got a script that already has a twist. He doesn't have to force it. It's there already. <laughs> and, and I think he could make it work. The, uh, the third one, I would do one called Living Doll. Living Doll. Oh, okay. Th that was the episode with Telly Savalas and a little girl who has a doll called Talking Tina. Oh, shit. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, he's like, my name is Talking Tina. And Before, I'm there yeah, Before, Before there was Chucky. Yeah, before there was Chucky. That's right. So yeah. that one, I would get the director would be dead. I mean, I mean, he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> he's he. Who are you gonna get? He's dead. No, he's dead. Uh, James Wan. Who oh, directed. okay. Now I would choose him not because of his insidious films or anything like that, but because of a film he did called Dead Silence. Oh, is that the the, the one with the puppet? The, the, yeah. With the so that would be my director of choice for that episode. And then the last one is called After Hours, where it's um, it's a mannequin at a store. And every night when the store closes, she comes to life and she wanders around and she has a life. But at a certain time, she has to return back to the department store and become a mannequin again. Oh, yes. I love that one. Beautiful episode. I would choose Jordan Peele. Uh, for that now i'm not a huge jordan peele fan i know i'm gonna get a lot of hate for it but i mean i like what he did with get out he showed some promise with nope um yeah. but i think this is right up his alley i think so yeah he's he's pretty badass i think you know yeah yeah so that those that's my choice for um for my remake now do you have one well since this was on the fly i know everybody <sighs> just uh, for uh, to put in perspective here, I just told her before we started recording, <laughs> and she's like, "Oh shit, I didn't get one." But <laughs> let's see. <laughs> All right, well, this one is just for shits and giggles. Okay. <laughs> and you're gonna have to help me with the cat. I have one actor that I want in the movie. I don't care where he goes in. Um, I would like to do actually. I would like to do all three of them. Um, <laughs> episode one of Star Wars. What was that piece of shit called? Oh, the Phantom Menace. Phantom Menace. Um, <laughs> what was the second one called? Because my my, you know, uh, the the second one was Attack of the Clones, and then the third one was Re uh, Revenge of the Sith. Okay, so yeah, I would like to redo all three of those. Okay, all right. And um, yeah, and, and somewhere in there, you know what? Somewhere in there, uh, Glenn pa uh, Glenn Powell has to be in there just because he's hot. <laughs> okay just because just because i you know what fuck it you know he could be all you want you know why not <laughs> you know with the southern accent that would be so hot oh wow <laughs> i mean this was supposed to be a uh, um a space western right right well you know there you go it's it's there like uh the forest is strong with this one. Oh yeah <laughs> and he he loves a volleyball no wrong movie oh, um oh, god <laughs> So yeah, I, I would really like to redo all three of those movies. Okay, so um, uh, yeah. so Qui Gon, oh, so Obi Wan would be Glenn Powell. <laughs> Glenn Powell, yes. Okay, all right. Now, who would you choose as your Anakin? No, oh, let's start with Baby Anakin first. Mm, any old fucking any, kid. Any right? kid will do, right? Yeah. All right. And you know, uh, what about Anakin as an adult? You know what I? I you know, like I see. Hmm. I would. You know what? Ryan Gosling. Okay. All right. Okay. There you go. Now, <laughs> fuck it. We're winging it here, folks. We're winging it. Uh, what about Pat? Uh, what's your name? I'm uh, Amadala, a prince or Queen Amadala. Yeah, um, Queen. Let's see, Padme, <laughs> Scarlett Johansson. You know what? You read my fucking mind. <laughs> fuck it, Scarlett Johansson. Okay, all right. Now, uh, okay, so we got our our our, our main characters. Okay, enough. you know what though? You know what though? Um, after watching Precinct uh, Thirteen, what what was the name? Uh, Lawrence Fishburne. 
Lawrence Fishburne. Oh, would be awesome as Mace Windu. Yes. Even yeah. though you know, I love I love Samuel L. Jackson. It's just you know, every time I look at him, I I just see motherfucker. You know, <laughs> I it doesn't work with being a Jedi. You know. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. I had that problem too. Yeah. Yeah. Lawrence Fishburne would be awesome. He'd be a cool ass freaking um Jedi. Okay. All right. Yeah. Now, what, yeah. what what about the director who would direct the? Oh, would you Anybody. get? Um, anybody um, but lucas <laughs> yeah pretty much <laughs> all right um, yeah. um okay so that's I, your, mean, that- I mean jj abrams i think he did a fine job yeah i think so too i mean a lot of people t- uh talk shit about the third one um uh, they talk the- shit about all of the new ones yeah <laughs> and uh you know i i think he did a great job with the force awakens um and he was he did he had to do damage control for the last one the uh, rise of skywalker so we can't really blame him for that um cuz I second- liked it. I liked all three of them. Yeah. Uh yeah, I did too. Um you know, I really to me they felt more Star Wars even if they were bad. Uh they felt more like a Star Wars film than the prequels did. Most definitely, yes. We'll yeah, I hope I hope people. we don't I hope we don't lose, uh, you know, our any any listeners over that one. You know, we'll be down to like, okay, from five to two listeners, you know. So, <laughs> <laughs> look, we're all Star Wars fans. It doesn't matter what side of the Force we're on. Oh, I like that. There yeah, you go. Yeah. All right. So, uh, what do you say we jump into this week's episode? Okay. Yes. Yeah, let's do all this. Right. So it's time for these remakes. Okay. So for the first one, prepare for the siege. It's terror in the night. It's the most shattering assault on a police station in history. Assault on Precinct 13. This is the siege. It's a goddamn siege. You want to stay here and hold until somebody comes, okay? We're in the middle of a city, inside a police station. A highway patrol officer two criminals, and a station secretary defend a defunct Los Angeles precinct office against a siege by bloodthirsty street gangs. The film we are talking about is Assault on Precinct 13 from 1976, and it is directed by none other than John Carpenter. The film stars Justin Stoker as Bishop, Darwin Jostin as Napoleon, Tony Burton as Wells, and Laurie Zimmer as Lee. So this one is one of my perennial favorites. I can watch this one over and over and over again. Awesome. And you know, this is my second time watching this. this really? Oh. Yeah. And, wow. you know, and it's funny because both times you told me to watch it. <laughs> and, and, and you're like, okay. The first time I was like, eh, okay, let me watch it. And, you know, I wasn't disappointed and I loved it even more watching it now. It was awesome. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's great. I mean, my takes on it is it had super tight suspense i mean um it tightens up and then it lets up a little bit then it mm-hmm. tightens up again then it lets up again you know and then you 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 tie that in with john carpenter's incredible fucking score that just yeah. beats at your soul every time i mean to me it was almost like the jaws theme it's like the score cues in oh shit something's going down mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and it, you know yeah and, you know, and it's funny because this is not a horror film. No, it's but, not. But it was scary. It was, you know, I mean, I, I was anxious. I was, you know, I was scared. I was, you know, it, it was it was such a good ride. It was really awesome. Oh, it was amazing. Um, I mean, his use of um, of camera, um, uh, how he uses his character, where he drives the plot, uh, the direction, the set, you know, the use of the set. It's almost as if he's unaware. John Carpenter, just like Escape from New York, he's mm-hmm. unaware that he's making a low budget film. Yeah, you know, and you know, to be honest, I mean, I didn't feel that way, you know, that no. it was a low budget film. It was so much fun. It was it was shocking. It was Oh, you yeah. talk about shocking when they blow away the little girl. Yes, that's exactly what I'm 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 sitting oh. there watching the movie and I'm like, oh, you know, you know, little girl wants to be picky and you know go back and exchange her freaking ice cream. I had no idea. I didn't remember this. I didn't know that she was gonna get shot. And I oh my God. And my heart such, broke. And in such a graphic way. I mean it, it uh Carpenter, you know, in recent interviews, he stated that yeah, he wouldn't t- if he were to do that now, he wouldn't 
take that scene out, but he wouldn't be as explicit as he was back then with that scene. But mm-hmm. but to me, it it really set the tone, set the pace that these these bad guys they're really fucking bad. They're not just like caricatures of bad guys. They're legit. They're evil. They're bad. They're evil. Exactly. I mean, he showed no emotion at the little girl. You know, there was no conflict. He was just like, no. Yeah. So the gist of the story, basically, and it's a simple plot. Um, Which I know, like. It's a, yeah. It's, you know, you got a father and a daughter. They're looking for uh, their aunt's house somewhere in L.A., and um they they stop for ice cream you know he gets on the phone to talk you know get directions and so the little girl goes for ice cream and she's killed the father goes to his little girl she's dead and he finds out there's a you know because they killed the ice cream man as well there's a mm-hmm. gun under the dashboard so he sees the gun grabs the gun and goes after the bad guys he finds them late at night and kills one of them mm-hmm. now they're after him and he runs off to the nearest police precinct which is one that's about to get shut down and it's like you got a skeleton crew of you just got a cop and a couple of secretaries and he runs off there mm-hmm. now the gang's are after him and they lay siege hundreds of these guys lay siege on the police station and hence is the gist of the film that you have a chp officer who's transporting three criminals one super criminal mm-hmm. and uh, one is sick and they have to stop at this precinct to try blah, blah 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 and then the siege comes down criminals have to team up with cops to fight them off mm-hmm. it's simple straightforward and fuck if it doesn't have you at the edge of your seat and you know and the, the the explanation in the in the beginning of the of the movie like i said very simple you know the, uh, apparently there were some uh, automatic weapons that went missing and now are in the hands of these thugs and you know they're like if these you know if these thugs join forces you know they're going to be indestructible yeah and there's also a statement i think a social statement that carpenter was making of the uh, out of control violence and and gang activity that was going on in the major inner cities Mm-hmm. And uh, in you know this this infiltration of of weapons and you know the, you know this proliferation of of high powered weapons that cops are being outmatched. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I mean it it was just amazing. And oh, I have to mention Darwin Justin mm-hmm. Na- Napoleon. Napoleon, which um, he was the main bad guy. The main bad guy. There there was a main bad guy. Yes. <laughs> Remember the one who got a smoke. Oh, but he's not a bad guy, though. He's like a anti-hero kind of. Well, yeah. Well, he's portrayed initially as a real badass, and you know, but a badass with a heart. And he played that part to perfection. He did. He really did. He was just. He was so smooth. And the thing is, is that we really don't know his backstory other than that he he did kill somebody. He was on death row, but he was supposed to tell that that other cop some his story. Yeah. yeah he's like, I'll tell you later. And I love that because sometimes less backstory done correctly, you know, it, it gives a mystique and a mystery to a character. Mm-hmm. Um, and you and you never get that backstory. All you know that he's, he was a badass. He killed somebody. He's in prison most likely for life, but he has a heart. He's a bad guy with a heart and a sense mm-hmm. of, um, of honor. Right, right. And, yeah, you know, and I love the chemistry between him and, and Lee, was it? Oh, oh yeah the uh, the secretary yes she oh, was he, awesome oh she was great too that's uh Lori zimmer she was great in this I, you know what i liked most was um these shots that they got of her when she was talking uh it's dark inside the precinct and there's just like strips of light and just just like a strip of light highlighting her eyes yes and you know that goes right back to carpenter not realizing he's working on a low budget uh you know a pulp film he's making a major film he's making us he's telling us a story he's taking it all the way he's using all the um all this whatever he can dig out the kit you know in, in out of the cupboards to make this work mm-hmm. he's making a, a film and he takes it seriously and and it's just beautifully shot and the, again camera work the acting everything he uses to perfection yes yeah you know i mean when you're on a low budget like that you got to utilize whatever you have on hand you know a lot of that is imagination and you know just being freaking creative and yeah, yeah it, it worked it, it was yeah like yeah. i said I, I love those scenes you know they were really cool oh yeah and what i also liked within the script is that napoleon his character 
subverted our expectations in that he keeps telling you, I'll tell you later, right? Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. It's like, what did you do? I'll tell you later. Uh, you, this and this and that. You know what? That's a story for another time. So what does that tell you? That's usual. Uh, that's typical foreshadowing of, oh, this guy's going to die and we're never going to hear a story. <laughs> But he doesn't die, which is great. Um, which is awesome. And, you know, and I love that that end part where, you know, you know, he's uh, the, the fucking cop tries to arrest him after all the bullshit that they just went through. Oh, and Bishop is like, no, he's walking out with me. Like, yes. Oh, he's like, oh. it, it, we, it would be my honor if you walk out with me. I was like, oh, shit, that was oh, fucking oh. awesome. Uh, it was. It was. And, you know, another sequence that really blew me away was when they first fall under attack and the shooting in the at the precinct all of the bad guys they have these you know these uh, assault rifles with silencers mm-hmm. so you don't hear that all you hear is glass breaking and popping everywhere yeah plop, 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 plop. yeah and, it was cool. oh, oh man i mean i was sitting there like that's intense uh you know really really good i mean you know the film had some great lines of levity um, mm-hmm. you know, some humor injected here and there, but not over like trying to be, you know, in your face. Oh, hello, look, here's a funny moment. But like yeah. uh when Lee offers Bishop coffee in the beginning. Oh, I love that fucking like <laughs> Oh, it's great. Now for reference, uh Bishop, the CHP officer, he's black, right? So he's at the new precinct to help see the changeover and make sure that everything closes up fine. He's, you know, like a little assignment he has. And Lee asks him, would you like some coffee? Sure. He says black for over 30 years. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh man. I lost it. I thought that was really funny. Overall. I tell you, I mean, I, I'm a sucker for, you know, single location thrillers. Mm-hmm. it gives you that feeling of isolation of, yes. of of being trapped and and like you stated it's true it's not a horror film but mm-hmm. it feels like a horror film yeah it feels like a horror disaster kind of film you know it, yeah. they're just trying to stay alive i mean there's that scene where the gang members are tearing through the windows and they're like zombies and you're like this is a feels like you're watching a horror film now john carpenter he did acknowledge Mm-hmm. that uh night of the living dead uh-huh. was an influence on him for the for the street gangs yeah you know and and, and i'm wondering because you made this connection uh the first time around a long time ago when you told me about this movie you're like oh dude you gotta watch precinct 13 it it reminds me a lot of resident evil 2 the video game that came out on, on sony playstation mm-hmm. and it takes place in, in, a, in a police station right so and guess what Resident Evil was inspired in the look and feel of uh, by Assault on Precinct 13. That is freaking awesome. So everybody was inspired here. Yeah, yeah. It's just great. I mean, Carpenter stated that he wanted to make him seem like the zombies in Romero's film because they're completely dehumanized. Mm-hmm. They were monsters, and, really. Yeah, and uh, they're almost supernatural in their ongoing resilience and mm-hmm. and, and attack. I mean... Uh, and it works. It really, really does. Yeah. I I have nothing bad to say about this movie. No, it, it's, uh, to me, it's, you know, it looks low budget. It's, it's obvious, you know, it's shot on a on, on cheap film or whatever. And it was back in 76. But everything else about it, the editing, the directing, the acting, the music, you know, the situations, none of it says to you low budget film. Yeah. And then for me, it, you know, watching it just give me, gave me a, a strong sense of nostalgia, you know, looking at all those old cars and, you know, just, yeah, it, it was, it was nice. I mean, granted it was, it was made before I was even born. I, I watched a lot of, you know, shows and movies of that era. It just, it was, it was really cool. I loved it. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I grew up in, in LA in, in, in the mid seventies and, um, uh, it's funny there's certain areas that you know like south central and compton i mean they, it, it was sparse back in the 60s and the 70s mm-hmm. there's you know it wasn't as congested and there was wide open spaces i mean the the area that they filmed in i know there was probably like I think probably slosson uh boulevard i'm not sure but there used to be a lot of dairies uh in those in those areas there was yeah there, there was a lot of factories on on slosson so yeah, with the the influence from uh, George Romero and it being, I mean, it's just 
it's 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 great so mm -hmm. what do you say we get into the box office and the budget on this yeah yeah all right so the budget at the time we mentioned it's a low budget film was a hundred thousand dollars whoa which is about five hundred and fifty thousand today damn at the time of its release uh, in general, the numbers were unavailable because it was shown in only a few theaters and it, it garnered only about eleven thousand uh, dollars at the time. So overall, yeah, it, it was considered a box office failure. It, again, it's a low budget film, small studio. They didn't give it a lot, a lot of uh, marketing and a wide release. So it did do. Well. And again, it's not a reflection of the film itself because there was a lot of films around that era into the 80s that were the same kind of genre feel that did really, really well. Mm hmm. But in 1978, it would be re-released as a double feature with Halloween. Oh, nice. So I guess there was able to recoup uh, its money, uh, especially uh, after Carpenter gained fame with Halloween at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So now let's get into some reviews and scores. Whitney Williams of Variety, she wrote... Some exciting action in the second half packs enough interest to keep this entry alive for the violence market. John Carpenter's direction of his screenplay after a pokey opening half is responsible for the realistic movements. Hmm, I agree. Okay, yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, so it did, uh, it, it did get some pretty positive reviews. Uh, again, not in wide release, but it, uh, for whatever, uh, overall, the, the reviews were quite uh, in the middle and to right. good to okay. Uh, mm -hmm. IMDb is sitting at a 7.3. Right. Mm -hmm. Metacritic 89. Rotten wow. Tomatoes, the critic score 96%. Wow. Yes. And audience score has this at 80%. And then Letterbox has this at 3.8 stars out of five. So critically, it, it is well received. Wow. That, that's not bad. Not bad. Not bad at all. So uh, let's give our ratings on this. I'll go first. I thought it was intense, suspenseful. It was gritty. Fuck it. Top notch thriller. I'm going to give this eight out of 10 precincts. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. I, I loved it as well. Um, you know, very scary without the monsters, but with the monsters, you know, um, I am going to give it, I'm going to give it 8.5 cigarettes. Oh, that's right. We're going with cigarettes, huh? Uh, what you do? Oh, you. I did precincts. You did precincts. Okay. So, That's okay. fine. I gave it precincts. You give it cigarettes. Okay. And That's now the. Right. <laughs> now the reason for that is that Napoleon, the main bad guy, turns good guy. From the beginning of the movie, he's handcuffed and everything, and cops are like, "Okay, move along." And he very cool, like you know, he looks over at the cops and got a smoke, got a cigarette. <laughs> Throughout the whole fucking movie, he's asking for a cigarette. So that's why cigarettes. Yeah, he he was my favorite character. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. I mean, I have not seen this guy in other stuff. And what's interesting, he he looks like he would be at home in a Western. Oh, yes. He definitely had that cowboy vibe. Yeah, and that cool Gary Cooper uh, kind of look to him. His, you know, or, you know, or Shane or something. He was mm -hmm. perfect. And what's interesting about that, it may not be a coincidence because when John Carpenter first ventured out to become a filmmaker, his favorite genre were westerns huh interesting and, and that's what he wanted to make was westerns but yeah. he ended up at the horror king so yeah, yeah. which i'm glad he, i i love that guy oh yeah a, a true a true true legend all right so what do you say we go with our second film now all right yeah let's do it all right so we're under siege again Fun and games? Does anybody work around here anymore? It was the night Precinct 13 was supposed to close its doors forever. No offense, officer, but we'll close it down. We're short staff. Central said we park here overnight until the road's clean. Until Detroit's most lethal prisoners changed everything. I'm responsible for everybody in here. That's my job. I assume you know who I am, Sergeant. You're a gangster. That's accurate. He's a cop killer. A police sergeant must rally the cops and prisoners together to protect themselves on New Year's Eve just as corrupt policemen surround the station with the intent of killing all of them to keep their deceptions in the ranks a secret. The film we are talking about is Assault on Precinct 13 from 2005, directed by Jean-Francois Richet. And the film stars Ethan Hawke, 
Lawrence Fishburne and Gabriel Byrne. All right. So have you seen this one before? Uh, have I? You know what? I want to say no. I and remember is, it coming out and I'm like, eh, don't want to watch it. Right. Yeah. Especially, I mean, you got such an iconic classic like the original from John Carpenter. Yeah. I had the same reaction. So what was your take on this? Well, my, my take is two totally different movies with uh, similarities. Yeah. Uh, it, it, you know, where uh, the original was more of, like I said, you know, more horror, more suspenseful, more, you know, um, um, disaster kind of movie. This was straight on action yeah you know and um which doesn't really make it a bad movie because you, you got some great actors here you know Lawrence Fishburne uh Ethan Hawke Gabriel Byrne you know great actors yeah you, you know one problem that I had with it was I mean again it's not a bad film it's not and like you said I agree 100 percent. You, you nailed it it's just a different movie um mm -hmm. bottom line but what I didn't like was it had too much unnecessary character development way too much mm -hmm. yeah the police sergeant played by ethan hawk you know his whole backstory he had a team undercover and their covers you know gets broken while they're on assignment and his whole team gets killed and he does and and you know he goes into therapy and he becomes a desk sergeant after that under therapy blah 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 da, da, da. really unnecessary go, yeah i mean granted yeah we do need some development of a character but uh unlike you know the, the original i mean the chp officer what do you know of him not very much nothing, nothing you know that he lives on the west side which for those who don't live in la or california the west side is the posh posh area that's where you get central <laughs> city yeah west hollywood beverly hills rodale drive all that shit the west hollywood is more affluent and he lives in the west uh west uh la area so but came he, from the hood but came from the hood exactly and um and so which by the way you know that story that uh, bishop tells uh when he's like um talking about his youth and how yeah he stole, and he stole something and his dad sent him to the police station and all that stuff yeah that's a that's a true story wow that's that's awesome and you know who the kid was who? alfred hitchcock oh no nah. Yeah, so that's an Alfred Hitchcock uh, uh, story. Nice little nod. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but back to the characters. Yeah, it was just um, the less you know, the better. I mean, you kind of know that, like, okay, the cop, he's a good cop. He's on assignment. He's a, he, you know, he's a career man. Yada mm -hmm. yada. The bad guy did something bad. What did he do? Something bad. That's all we need to know. Exactly. Uh, and I think what was more terrifying in the original uh, was that the attackers who were laying siege upon the the, the police station they were faceless. We didn't exactly. know. They didn't talk. We didn't sit down there and go, "Okay, we're gonna take down these people." Oh, they're in there. No. no. We we didn't know why the hell. I mean, we assumed that they were there to take over. Well, to um get revenge for their fallen you know member yeah exactly that's the only reason it was a simple very basic uh um you know motive behind their mm -hmm. their aggression um which almost makes them like an animal you know like animals but here the attackers are a bunch of crooked cops who are uh, out to take you know the take you know the big bad guy in this one is lawrence fishburne and mm -hmm. he has he was working with cro crooked cops yeah so they want to take him out and he's in this precinct. So they lay siege upon it. And you got Gabriel Byrne, who's a damn good actor. I love that man. Yeah. And a wasted uh, role for him, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he's the head cop and he gets all these cops together with all the tactical gear to lay siege upon it. And they have their motives and, and just too much. It, it's, it's just unnecessary. You know, and the, and the thing is, is that, you know, with these cops, you know, granted they're, they're bad cops, but right. you know, you, 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 it makes you think they got into the force for a reason. Right. And that's because they were initially, you know, good people that wanted to serve the community, but that got corrupted along the way by, you know, by money, you know, right. um, whereas in the original film, these, these fuckers have no conscience. They're, they're just bad 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 people right and and th that makes it makes them scarier i think because yes. they're only uh, 
they're not out of, you know about power about money or anything like that mm -hmm. they're just evil and oh gosh one thing like Lawrence Fishburne as we mentioned he plays a character named Bishop mm -hmm. Bishop was the name of the character of the cop in the original oh oh that's right uh-huh and Ethan Hawke when he's undercover in the beginning of the remake his name is Napoleon oh what the hell Oh, so they, they got to switch it up. It's that like is uh, dumb. That is really it, dumb. Yeah, that was kind of lame. It's like, oh, let's give a nod to the original. Okay, how mm -hmm. about just make your own film and you know? Yeah, they uh, should have. I mean, it, mm. now while you know, while Fishburne was great, he's a great fucking actor, but he did not have a cold killer feel and look that that uh, Darren Justin had uh, mm -hmm. in the original. I mean, he was. He was cool. He was slick, but he was dangerous. And, you know, he, he could do bad shit and you believed it. And yeah, he was more of a Morpheus in this. Yeah. He was a bad guy, Morpheus. <laughs> yeah, uh, pretty much. And, uh, but you know, overall it was not a bad action flick for what it was. I mean, oh, it, was, it, it had a good premise, you know? Yeah. You know, it, it was cliched. Crook, yeah. The crooked cops, you know, want to, you know, snuff out this guy that could potentially out all of them. Right, right. Well, and, which you know, was a cool story, but what I really, okay, so like you said, it, it wasn't really a bad movie. What I didn't like was they took it out of the precinct. Yes, yes. And there was, I, there was no more of that claustrophobic, you know, anxiety driven, they're going to get me, you know, feel. Right, I'm trapped and so forth. <laughs> That definitely took me out of the film o o overall. I mean, you know, say, uh, Ethan Hawke, good actor, mm -hmm. but but not stand out. No. But you know what made him look better, though? What? John Leguizamo. John Leguizamo was actually pretty funny in this. He was he pretty was, good. Okay, just, you know what? The, the, the one little joke that I find, found, you know, funny was, you know, when they were harassing him before he got onto the, the the bus, like you know, they were calling him like a crackhead and shit. Like, right. And you know, your eyes are all bloodshot. You know, your high. Like, well, they, they, he makes some joke about glazed donuts. That that's all I remember. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he did the best he could, and I think he was pretty much the most standout uh, actor in I the film. I, I couldn't stand him. He reminded <laughs> me of that character from Ice Age that he played. Oh God, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That was him. He was so obnoxious, and I was glad when he died. I'm sorry. Yeah. Now, and then you got, and then the supporting cast overall, which included like Osamo, you had Drea, DeMatteo, Ja Rule, Brian Dennehy, uh, mm -hmm. Aisha Hines, all good actors. Mm -hmm. um, but they were just kind of throw away. They were just there. They were, they really didn't make an impact overall. I mean, you had just a couple of extra characters in, um, well, one extra character, which was uh, Wells in the original, mm -hmm. uh, who I thought did a great job. That was played by Tony Burton. Uh, he was in Rocky, remember? He was uh, uh, Apollo Creed's trainer. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. He was a really cool character. Yeah, he was. So even as small as that character was, it was still more effective than the entire cast in this one. Mm hmm yeah. yeah. Oh, you know what really annoyed me? They, uh, the the secretary. Oh, Andrea uh, uh, De Matteo. Yeah. Okay. So first off, you know, in the original, you have Lee, who is just like this really badass. You know, she gets shot on the arm. She goes, "Yeah, it hurts <laughs> like hell." Very sexy and sultry. Right. You know, and that's what she was. She was very, you know, it's very sexy, very beautiful. They get this. They put in. They wrote her in as a slut. Yeah, and I like Drea De Matteo. I've seen her in a couple of films. I know she was in uh, uh, Sons of Anarchy. She was in The Sopranos, and she's a damn good character actor. She's really good. But here, she's just like she's not a secretary. She's a hooker. She, I don't know. She, she, what, what, she, she had this this thing where she wanted to fuck every fucking bad boy that came into the precinct, and yeah. she made that obvious. Right. I mean, you know what? And that's one thing that I love about Carpenter, uh, which is not very obvious, but if you look, it is. Uh, Carpenter is a feminist in the sense that he believes in strong female characters. I mean, you look at Halloween, uh, yeah. The Fog, uh, mm -hmm. Escape from New York. You had uh, Bar uh, Adrian Barbeau in, in that one. And mm -hmm. in, in, in the original, yeah, Lee 
was a strong character. She grabs a gun and she's shooting at the bad guys. And she's, you know, and she ain't it, missing either. She's a, and, she's a good shot. Yeah. And then, yeah. And so that maybe the director, this was his version of, well, here's a strong female character. No. She wants to fuck everybody. Uh, I hated that. I really did. They, they could have like not thrown that in there. And you know, the, the, the um, sexual harassment, you know, Oh geez. All yeah. over the place, you know. Um Ethan Hawk, you know, basically say, Yeah, you like me. You yeah. Know, it's like, dude, you would have gotten in so much trouble for that shit. Yeah, exactly. And it's funny because sexual harassment was more commonplace in the seventies, yet there's none of that in that movie. And then we got two thousand five where sexual harassment is frowned upon. This it's it's all over the place. Yes, you know, I, I think uh, the original was much more classy. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean, even though the you, know, you got characters that are much more fleshed out in this one, the characters in the original still had more depth, and they had less uh, character development. Yeah, definitely more more chemistry at that. So, a quick behind the scenes, just one really interesting fact was that both the original and the remake. They're loose remakes of a 1959 Howard Hawks uh, Western called Rio Bravo that starred John Wayne and Dean Martin, where, yeah, yeah, where there's a small town sheriff in American West, in American West, who enlists the help of a disabled man, a drunk and a young gunfighter uh, to hold, you know, the, the, the fort at, at a jail um, mm. where they have, yeah, the brother of a local bad guy is there and they're trying to get to him and so forth. So there's John Carpenter going uh, back to the Western, which he loves so much. Makes sense. Makes perfect sense. Yeah. So, and, and if you think about it, if you really look at uh, the original again, yeah, it's a, it, it's an action film, but it feels like a horror film, but it's mm -hmm. also like a Western. So. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Wow. And, that is cool. Yeah. And that's what makes the original so, you know, so good is that it's special. There's something special to it. There's nothing special in the remake. Um, it's kind of like a run of the mill actioner which is not a bad thing but there's nothing special to it exactly and you know and i'm gonna say i've said it before and i said it again you know if you're gonna you know do um a remake have some massive respect for the original unless it was shit <laughs> right unless it, it was shit and it really 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 needed you know to be redone but if it was really awesome you know come on respect it yeah no i agreed i mean and uh it, I would have kept the same tone of the original, uh, mm -hmm. make it a, a suspense horror, you know, actioner, you know, kind of thing. But again, you, you're, you're working, the source material is, you know, by a master, John Carpenter. And mm -hmm. so, you know, either you do something original, completely different, or you mimic a master. And either way, it's a loose, loose situation in most cases. Yeah, exactly. That, that's why, yeah, making a remix is such a, you know. It's hit and miss. It, it really, really is. is. Mm -hmm. So let's get into the box office and budget on this. The budget at the time was about $25 million, which is about $40 million today. Okay. And box office at the time, $35 million, which is about $56 million. So it really wow. didn't. And now keep in mind that uh, budget uh, number is before marketing and distribution. Mm -hmm. So this movie, if you look at it, it made nothing. It actually lost money. Damn, that's, wow. Yeah, yeah. And um, again, you know, I have to attribute that to it's just an average uh, generic actioner, nothing special to it. Yep. It doesn't scream out to you. Yeah, it has Ethan Hawke, has Morpheus or whatever. But, um, you know, th there's nothing that, that really screams classic or anything. Exactly. So um, reviews and scores, um, it generally opened to mixed reviews. Kevin Thomas of the LA Times, he actually uh, he enjoyed it. He, he said, Assault on Precinct 13 is smart. It's satisfying action entertainment and also a perceptive work of considerable artistry. Okay, Kevin, uh, relax. Wow. Okay. Yeah, relax, Kevin. It, it wasn't that great. Yeah, Please. seriously, man. He <laughs> nutted on that one. Yeah. <laughs> You, you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> a little, a little extra for your popcorn. Um. Oh wow, you didn't have to go there, dude. <laughs> you fucking started it. I you, started, baby. You just went there. Oh wow. <laughs> All right, so uh, IMDb is sitting at a six point three, Metacritic fifty four, Rotten Tomatoes critic score 
60%, audience score 48, and Letterbox has this at 2.9 out of 5. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so it critically uh, it was not well received, except for the very excited Kevin Thomas. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> um, but overall, it didn't do well. So what's your ratings on this? Okay, are we still going with cigarettes? Because there wasn't We're, really any cigarettes until to the very right. end. We'll go with cigarettes. We'll go with cigarettes? All right. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, like I said, it was its own movie. Um, I wouldn't... Uh, same name, but I wouldn't compare it. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't... I wouldn't go into it expecting, you know, the original in any means. I, I respect it for, for an action movie. So I'm going to give it uh, 6.5 uh, cigarettes. All right, cool. Uh, I, um, I, I found it, it was formulaic. It was cliched by the numbers. But nonetheless, I mean, it, it was pretty entertaining. I mean, nothing new, uh, mm. just very standard. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm also going to give it a 6.5 out of 10 uh, cigarettes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, nothing special, really. You know, you like yeah. you, know, you you like that kind of thing. You know, there you go. Exactly. Yeah. Now, overall, I mean, I think this is just proof positive. Give me one John Carpenter film remake that has done well or was good. Uh, I didn't like the uh, the the Halloween ones. I hated it. Yeah, Halloween, The Fog, mm -hmm. this one. Yeah. Um, and and that's um. If anything, Carpenter should wear that as a badge of honor in that no one can remake his films. Exactly. And, you know, I mean, and even if they could, you know, I, I you know, as, uh, you know, John Carpenter, I would have been like, yeah, you know, good job. But yeah, you know, nobody can can uh, reach his level. Yeah. I mean, there's been talk about remaking um, Big Trouble in Little China. Ah, uh, oh, don't do it. Escape from New York. Mm. uh christine uh i know christine is getting a remake actually um i'm, I'm curious I, I i'd watch it yeah i mean i'll watch the remakes and, and just out of curiosity but i uh, i know i'm not going to get w the goods uh because john carpenter is a very specific director he has a very distinctive style i mean uh he directs with the camera and with his score mm -hmm. and, oh yeah and, definitely and i think that that's one thing that the remake was sorely missing was a pulse pounding score that that drove you to to feeling anxiety yeah. um a, a score makes a movie it, it you know it's it's a very big part of the movie if you don't have a good score to to movie you know yeah you know it, it just doesn't feel right yeah i mean case in point the fog which mm -hmm. was an amazing the john carpenter version which was an amazing horror ghost pirate story or what fishermen or whatever the fuck they were. Um, yeah. It was, you know, it, it was the score and, and, and Carpenter's creepy camera work and, and really, you know, dragging you into this horror. You can and, smell the seawater, you know? Yeah. You can feel the, the mist. Uh, and uh, so I don't, I have to conclude that John Carpenter as a filmmaker and his body of work uh, cannot be replicated, duplicated, or remade. Nope, he the man. He the man, he the man. All right, so what do you say we start winding this one down? Yeah, okay. All right, so uh, once again, uh, next week is our season finale, and uh, mm -hmm. please join us for that as we cover the best and the worst of. Ooh. That's going to be fun. So um, we really hope uh, you enjoyed the show. Please help to support the podcast by giving us a five-star rating. Give us a good review. Or another way you can support the podcast is simply to subscribe and or follow us on Amazon, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Deezer, Audible, Boomplay, or wherever you get your podcast fix. Also, don't forget to drop by our Instagram page, uh, check out uh, our TikTok, and we also have a YouTube channel where we have all of our current episodes on as well. You can also contact us directly by email to thefilmjoepod at gmail.com. We'd love to hear your feedback. So, final thought of the day. Hmm. Got a cigarette? <laughs> <laughs> perfect perfect way perfect way to, to end the episode okay so with <laughs> so with that being said i'm joe i'm daisy 
And this is the Film Joe Podcast, where film talk happens. Three, two, one.